Welcome, my name is Eric Castango. I'm President and CEO of Clinical IQ and Critical Point. Hi, my name's Martha Polovich. I'm an oncology nurse and assistant professor at Georgia State University in Atlanta. I'm Patricia Keenly. I'm the, a pharmacist and director of accreditation and medication safety for Cardinal Health Innovative Delivery Solutions. I'm Ellen Kessler. I'm the medical director of the Inova Occupational Health Program in Northern Virginia. All right, ladies. Well, are we ready for 800? So let's dive into the questions that everybody's been wanting to know about is what is USP 800 and why does it exist? So, Patty, want to start with you? Yeah, I guess I can start. 800 is an extension of the compounding issues that are addressed in, in USP. And the existing compounding chapters don't cover hazardous drugs in any great detail. So 800 was created to extend the information in hazardous drugs and also not just to protect patients, which is the issue with the, the basic compounding chapters, but also to protect healthcare workers and the environment. Okay. So why did, why did USP feel there was a need for a separate chapter? I mean, when you think about all of the other guidance documents that were out there. And that's it. It's the guidance documents that are there. And physicians, nurses, pharmacists, other medical areas have had guidance documents, but there's been nothing that has been an enforceable chapter and an enforceable standard, and this creates that. Marty, from a, from a nursing perspective, 800, I mean, what's, what's the perception from a nursing perspective about USB 800? Well, I think that, first of all, nurses are not that aware of the, what USP is and what USP can do, and so it's very unfamiliar to practicing nurses. They may have seen USP on an IV bag as they recognize that, that, you know, oh, okay, I know this is an IV of D5W or normal saline, but they're really not aware of the, um, the standards for safety, medication safety. And so most nurses won't be familiar with USP 800. Okay. And how about physicians, Ellen? How, how, they, how are they understanding what this chapter is all about? Well, I think it's the same thing yeah. for physicians. Yeah. I think they're not as aware of the dangers of handling um, hazardous drugs. I remember as a resident um, handling, I was responsible for drawing up methotrexate mm -hmm. and um, vincristine, and it was just part of what I did, right. and I just had no clue. So we're talking about hazardous drugs. What is a hazardous drug? I mean, there, that's probably one of the $64,000 questions. What is a hazardous drug, and what are we doing? Well, a hazardous drug can fall into any category or any of these categories. If it's genotoxic so that it disrupts the DNA and causes muta mutations, mm -hmm. if it is carcinogenic and causes cancer, um, if it is uh, teratogenetic, meaning that it affects the development of the fetus or the embryo, mm -hmm. or if it is um, toxic to organs at low doses. And also, NIOSH added a, an extra definition that if it's a new drug that mimics one that is known to be a hazardous drug, that should be considered a hazardous drug as well. You know, I think one thing is important for folks to know is that we're talking about those drugs that are hazardous from a NIOSH perspective. They're hazardous to us as healthcare professionals. Right. It's different from the EPA hazardous materials. And there's a couple of confusion points that come up there. First of all, that word hazardous shows up in both. So that's a confusion point. And there are some drugs on both lists. But what we're talking about from 800 are those that are hazardous to us as healthcare personnel. So. What are some of the challenges we're going to get in, in moving the needle and getting people to really start to change behaviors? Because this is really all about behavior. A, a good portion of it is about getting people's perceptions changed about a drug. I mean, historically, drugs make people better. But I think the ch we have a very unique challenge with hazardous drugs is that these drugs in and of themselves are toxic to the people who handle them. So how do we, how do we, how do we tackle some of those challenges? Well, I think one of the challenges, first of all, is that healthcare workers who have been handling hazardous drugs for a long period of time um, don't recognize their opportunity for exposure in doing their everyday work. And they think they're doing good for patients, and they are. But they're not really thinking about the potential of their being exposed and having some adverse health outcomes. And there's a lot of evidence to show that workers are being exposed just doing their everyday work. But we're not seeing the body count. We're not seeing, un unlike some of the major contamination events that we have seen over the last several years, we're not seeing the incidence of cancer increase or 
you know, do we know of anybody? I mean, obviously there's been a couple um, larger or more popular cases where, um, you know, pharmacists or nurses or other healthcare workers have been uh, diagnosed with cancer, but, you know, we're not, you know, we're not seeing that same, that same immediate impact because of the long-term exposure and the time it takes to develop a cancer. Doesn't, is that a, an accurate statement? Well, I think that is an accurate statement. I mean, there is a lag time between the time of the exposure and the incidence of cancer, and some people actually don't connect the two. And I think that's something that, with this, we're going to be able to do a little bit more accountability. I also think that we're not asking people to connect their exposure or they're working with hazardous drugs with their um, with adverse health outcomes. So if you're not collecting data, then you'll never have right. that information. So that's an area where we really need to be working is collecting that long-term health data. And I bet we've all heard somebody say, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. There's nothing wrong with me. Right. And, and I mean, my, my pushback is always, we should be scientists. Right. <laughs> An N of one does not count. I, I mean, we really need that longitudinal data to be able to identify what these issues are, and we just don't have it in many cases yet. And we also owe it to new nurses and new healthcare workers coming into the field. I mean, they're the ones that we really need to, I mean, you know, really get the message to as well. So let's now talk about the impact of USP 800 by each discipline. Let's start with pharmacy, Patty. Tell us about that. Well, I guess that's the one that people traditionally think are most impacted, but I actually think probably in, in our situation, probably nursing more is, so Marty probably has a lot of comments. There's issues that have been going on forever, and we've known this. We've known the issues and the risks for decades. We've had guidance documents from at least pharmacies since the mid-'80s. We've known in Europe, Japan, Australia, that they've had far more emphasis on how to, to handle this. So it's not really much different from what we've known all along. And if people have been following, particularly in the health system side, on the sterile compounding side, the issues of USP 797, they really should have had these addressed by now. I think the bigger challenge from a pharmacy perspective, maybe from the community compounders who, who do a lot of non-sterile stuff as well, who may not have been attuned to this. But it affects all of us. So from a nursing perspective, obviously, you know, pharmacy has a lot of protections afforded to it with, you know, containment, negative pressure, biological safety cabinets. You have the nurse who's interacting directly with these very toxic substances. That's right, and I think that the changes that USP standards are bringing out, the USP 800 standards are bringing out related to the use of closed system transfer devices are going to be the biggest thing for nurses to overcome. Currently, only about a quarter of nurses are using hazardous, uh, are using CSTDs for administering hazardous drugs, and this standard makes it a requirement whenever the dosage form allows. So that would be uh, intravenous infusions, it would be intravenous injections or anything that uh, is administered in a way that could use those kinds of connections. So that's going to be a requirement, which means that 100% of nurses who are using anti-neoplastic agents will have to learn how to use closed system transfer devices and to help select that those will be uh, appropriate for their organization. One of the things that I see, I hear a lot about with nursing is the PPE, is the personal protective equipment and scaring the patient. You know, coming, you know, coming all wrapped up in, a, in the moon suit to administer chemo. How do, how do we get nurses to do a better job wearing PPE? Because that's true of the physicians and pharmacists is, you know, people minimize the importance of it because, you know, they don't think that these substances are going to harm them. Right, and there, there is a requirement in USP for using personal protective equipment and the appropriate PPE right. that's been chemo tested. So gowns and gloves, yes, a requirement, right. and other PPE when necessary. So um, organizations are going to have to first provide the personal protective equipment, right. and then nurses and other healthcare workers are going to have to be committed to using the PPE every time they handle hazardous drugs. As to the issue of scaring patients, that's a common thing that nurses report they don't want to scare their patients but to be honest if you have open communication with patients and you explain that they're the ones who need the drugs I'm a nurse I'm doing this all day every day and I don't need the drugs patients should be accepting of that 
If you include that as a part of the education prior to starting uh, chemotherapy or using other hazardous drugs, so patients are reasonable. And I really think that we need to get over that right. because we don't apologize for using PPE in, uh, for isolation, for infection right. control. Um, you say the word Ebola and everybody's got their PPE on. Right. So I think we need to treat it in the same way. It's for healthcare worker protection. How about physicians, Ellen? I mean, I, I, you know, I see certain healthcare providers being somewhat cynical about new regulations. How about physicians? I mean, this is going to have a significant impact, especially in healthcare settings with medical surveillance and that whole issue about PHI and, and small community practices. Sure. I mean, there will be a learning curve, but I think that um, physicians will be adaptable. We see this in regular industry. We see a lot of belly aching, want a new standard is put into place. I've never seen a company go out of business because of it. Um, and so there will be a learning curve, I think, in terms of the surveillance. Um, those for non-occupational medicine physicians are probably new concepts. Um, first of all, you know, the idea that you want to get a good history and a work history. Some physicians are going to have to learn about what a good work history is, and that's to include reproductive history. Um, having a focused physical exam, um, doing the right uh, biological testing and laboratory testing that is really tailored to that specific surveillance and what surveillance is. Surveillance is something that's done confidentially and it's done to gather information, um, to find out more about that individual and also as a collective to get any kind of information to see if trends or any kind of trend analysis in terms of the impact that those drugs have on groups. That's great. You know, I think there's some other folks who have been left out of the equation too. And Marty mentioned the CSTDs and we've talked about the PPE, but I look at a small, very small subset of drugs that are given outside of a typical area. And a lot of times it's in an OR right. um, situations. And, and there's a handful of drugs that this applies to, but there's technicians who have been preparing these drugs who may not be aware of the risks. So it's not just limited to physicians and nurses and pharmacists and pharmacy techs. It's anybody in healthcare who touches these. So urology clinics need to know this. Surgical services need to know this. And there's cases in those drugs that may require, that do require, additional PPE other than the gloves and gowns that we've talked about so far. And on even maybe even to broaden that, that exposure is veterinary practices. I mean, my understanding is that treatment yeah. of cancer in animals That's is, a growing is huge. Field. Yeah. It's huge. And, and when you think about the knowledge deficit that exists in the veterinary practice and the awareness that needs to happen there, it's, it's not just in human care, but also animal care because it's going to be the humans that are handling these substances and administering to the patients. And, and in that kind of practice, it's not just specialty areas who do that, right. but pretty much every veterinary practice is involved in that. So the veterinarians as well as the techs. Absolutely. So uh, out, uh, in oncology, I think the oncology nurses and oncologists and oncology pharmacists pretty much get it right. in most instances. But USP 800 applies to all hazardous drugs on the NIOSH list, and that goes outside of oncology practice. So we've got lots of um, drugs that are not used in the treatment of cancer. They're right. used for non-oncology indications. Those healthcare workers really need to get on board with the risks of exposure in you know, outside of oncology. Or even the antineoplastics that are used for non-oncology right. conditions. Right. That is pretty ubiquitous too, and a lot of people are missing that issue. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's also important to remember that so much of this is done in the outpatient setting as yes. well, and that um, it's a lot of the outpatient, you know, private doctor's offices have not gotten the message. And I think that's really going to be a very important focus that we're going to need to have. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the newer drugs that are coming to market are oral medications. Yeah. So it's not the typical intravenous IM or you know, parenterally administered, which we think most of the hazards are exposed to. We're also dealing with oral medications that also p uh, pose a risk. Now, Ellen, you said something interesting about you know, people haven't gone out of business because of the standard. You know, one of the things that we hear quite frequently, the, the pushback is, oh my God, we're going to bankrupt the country and our healthcare system with these standards. You, you, know, uh, you know, obviously regulations do cost money. 
Um, so any thoughts on the, the implications of the cost associated with complying with USP 800? Well, if we have to look at this from a pharmacy perspective, those people who do sterile compounding, this should not be an issue to because there's been pieces in USP 800, I'm sorry, 797 that go back to 2004 and certainly since 2008. Yeah. So if people are compliant now from a facility perspective with 800 for sterile comp with 797 for sterile compounding, they will be with 800. Right with a couple of small exceptions, and I don't mean to minimize those, but right. you know, they're, they're out there. The bigger push may be for those community compounding pharmacies that do non-sterile preps, and a lot of them are the hormones. They're not the antineoplastics that we're talking about, but the significant compounding done with um, progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone people need to be aware of those risks, and those folks do need to make some changes. We've heard costs all over the board from 10,000 up to the millions. I think people need to take a look at their facility. Maybe not every facility is appropriate for doing this compounding. And I don't mean to minimize it or to sound cavalier, but we need to protect ourselves as well as our patients. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think this is a, 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 a reinvestment in pharmacy because you know, typically pharmacy doesn't get the, the necessary dollars and the support that it needs to get the infrastructure, the physical yeah. plan, and we're dealing with physical plants that are 30, 40 years old that are wholly inappropriate even for USP 797. So maybe this will move the needle, get people to start to pay attention, and a, another incentive to get that, that standard. And I think one of the, the issues that come up too, particularly with physician practices, certainly there are the community-based physicians who aren't associated with health systems, and they're the ones that probably need to get the message right, stronger right. because there, there's no other way that they get that. But so many health systems now are buying clinics and physician practices and all of a sudden recognizing that there's some facilities within that health system that aren't compliant with regulations, right. with expectations, and certainly with accreditation standards. Yeah, well, you know, they say people respect what other people inspect now. And I think That's a good that, point. you know, we have to realize that you know, we need to be held accountable to our, our employees and, and make sure, you know, we've always been very pa uh, patient-centric. We've always been very concerned about do no harm and making mm -hmm. sure that we make the IV sterile and we don't contaminate it and we don't add anything that we shouldn't. We now really, if you think about USP 800, part of it is a, a, an employee safety standard and that's, a, 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 and that's a real important thing. So when you think about costs from a nursing perspective, you know, I, I look at this as kind of, you know, CSTDs obviously is going to add a new dimension of, of, of cost. But PPE, to your point, Marty, before, that should have been always the standard of care. And I think, you know, I always say to people, when you spend nothing on quality or nothing on protection, anything more than zero is a lot of money. And I think now new line items on budgets now have to be reexamined to look at, you know, really what is the cost of using PPE correctly. Well, and, and um, commonly, uh, I never met a nurse who liked to wear a gown. Right. And so nurses got the message about gloves, I think, over the last 30 years since right. the guidelines came out. But not everyone got the message about gowns. And so that will be, uh, you know, have to have gowns available. You can't use them if they're not available. And now it's going to be a requirement. So it will increase the cost. So you think about harmonization. Do you think when you think about... ONS and ASCO and ASHP and APHA and all of the alphabet soup of, of all of our professional organizations. What do you think the role of each of these organizations are with this standard and, and how can they best get their members to embrace and adopt and implement this standard? I mean, I mean obviously pharmacy is leading the way and you know, USP is always viewed as a, a pharmacy document, but I think with the exposure that CDC and, and CMS, you know, everybody's starting to now realize CMS is now inspecting for compliance to 797. When's that gonna change to 800? I imagine that's not gonna take too long before CMS starts to realize that, you know, they're gonna hold people accountable. But how, how do we get all of, the, all of the healthcare professionals, the allied health professionals to, to, to come together and, and embrace the standard and, and communicate that collective information to their membership. You know, there's a couple of things that really strike me from joint statement documents. Right. And one is the ASCO 
ONS, HOPA. So the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the Oncology Nursing Society, and the, the Hematology Oncology Pharmacy Association got together with a joint statement. And it doesn't say in there you must follow 800, but it does have all the key elements that are in there alerting all of these. And I always like to speak about a particular disciplines document when I'm talking to them. So we think of USP as standing alone in pharmacy, but we're not. Those other organizations support that information too. Another one that comes to mind is a letter that was sent in April of 2011 to every CEO of every health system in the country. And it was a joint letter from the Joint Commission, OSHA, which is a regulatory agency, <laughs> and NIOSH, an advisory group, essentially saying, you know, your employees are being exposed to these. Are you doing the appropriate things? I'm paraphrasing, of course. But it was a letter that so many people don't know about. Right. And that letter is still on websites of, of those three organizations. You can get that information there. It's really a good synopsis from an administrative standpoint of what people should be looking about, particularly in their health care But system. You know, that's a great document. But, but how do we get that document out to the physician yeah. practices and to yeah. the nurses? I mean, the, the staff nurses that are dealing with this day to day, because I think the leadership gets it, generally speaking. Managers get it. But how do we get nurses and physicians, technicians, you know, uh, delivery personnel, how do we get them to understand that, that such a document exists and that this is on everybody's radar screen? That's easier said than done. It certainly um, is. But uh, one thing I like to say is it takes the whole village. Right. So if we're talking about healthcare organizations, then we have to have involvement from all the disciplines in every organization. Uh, big or small, it's got to include the administrators as well as the leaders in pharmacy and nursing and housekeeping and safety. And I think very importantly, the quality department. Right. Right. Quality and improvement. Risk management. Risk and, management. Right. Yeah. So they're used to getting a standard, doing an evaluation, seeing where the deficits are based on data, and then implementing the standards and, and measuring. So organizations recognize that sort of quality improvement process, and I think that's where 800 uh, can best be implemented. You have to use you know, the quality improvement process. And I think there needs to be a requirement. I mean, we have to, at my institution, we have to go through the training for shots fired, for, you know, people with hearing impairments. I mean, there are a whole um, load of different types of training we have to have, and I think this should be one of the required trainings as a competency. You know, that's a really good point, because you figure every health organization has an annual in-service day that people go through, whether it's in person or online or whatever, and you're right. I mean, that kind of information probably isn't put out, it's and that would be a really out. good place no, for No, it's it. not put out. Because that's globally handles all of those healthcare workers. And where it's not put out also is for the different uh, medical societies. Right. So I think that there needs to be some concerted effort to get the message across during, you know, uh, national meetings, local meetings, that kind of thing. And I think it's up to the hospitals to, to be a part of that. You know, and we're, we're a very scientifically driven well, our, our, our relative disciplines, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy, you know, we profess to be evidence-based practitioners. And, and here, and you know, this is one of my favorite expressions, is here we have, this, this area is replete with data that goes back decades, and we continue to fight it as professionals, whether it's medicine or nursing or pharmacy, thinking that it doesn't apply to me, that these numbers don't matter. I mean, how do we, how do we, how do we over, you know, so, uh, you know, one of the criticism is that, well, there's no evidence to support this position. My God, in this area, we do have the evidence. We absolutely do. In fact, I always think about this one study that was printed, published in 2012, it was part of the um, Nurses 2 study, mm -hmm. and they looked at um, nurses handling anti-neoplastic agents, right. and there was two times the incidence of uh, spontaneous abortions in the first trimester compared to nurses not handling ne anti-neoplastic agents. So there is the data out there, but people think it's not happening to me. Right. So the problem is it is happening to yeah. them. Right, and I think that since we don't have that aggregation, we don't have uh, 
that awareness every day that's in our face, we become very immune to it just because of all of the other factors that are driving our challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and that's the, the importance of medical surveillance because it's not only just um, getting information to the individual, it's relaying information to them as well. So it's a perfect time, it's done in a confidential way, it's a perfect time to get a good history, but also at that time when somebody's listening to give them the information they need to hear. So, uh, so to that point, Ellen, how do we get, and, and I think about what Marty said earlier before about we're not keeping track. We don't have a registry of everybody who handles a hazardous drug. We don't keep score every day of how many grams of cyclophosphamide or methotrexate or 5-FU, a nurse, you know, a technician is compounding, a pharmacist is checking, a nursing is, you know, a nurse is administering or a physician is, is administering. How do, we, how do we take that data or how do we start collecting that data and roll it up so people can start to see that, you know, I mean, you think about some of these substances being akin to asbestos and DDT and dioxin. I mean, we would never permit these in our institute. I mean, they're per forbidden, but these drugs, many of these drugs are IARC-1. They're known human carcinogens. And we just have this cavalier attitude without understanding that that cumulative exposure. I mean, how do we how do we take the medical surveillance? How do we take the exposure and, and start to create a registry to, so we can start to really look at the impact? Well, I, I think that goes to a bigger issue. OSHA has what's called the hierarchy of controls. And we've talked about engineering and we've talked about PPE. Right. So at the very top is the engineering, at the very bottom is the PPE. Right. Right in the middle is administrative controls, and that's what you're talking about. It's work practices, it's data registry, it's um, policies, that's where medical surveillance is. So that needs to be part of the infrastructure, and that needs to be, I mean, you have to have a concerted, educated way of going about protection. And by using the OSHA principles, getting that sort of concept and that philosophy to the people in charge is really what's going to be needed. So, um, you know, there needs to be uh, preparation for that. You need to get risk management involved. If there's an employee health, they clearly need to be involved. The C-suite needs to be involved with this. This has to be a culture change. And administrative is probably one of the most effective points. It's certainly Studies have shown it's more effective in a lot of ways than PPE. Right. PPE is last resort. We saw an example with an individual in Dallas, Texas, using perfect PPE. Nevertheless, she contracted Ebola, right. and it certainly wasn't her fault. It was that that infrastructure wasn't in place. Okay. You know, the, the Ebola thing is sort of interesting with using that as sort of a case study yes. for what we need for hazardous drugs. Right. I think a lot of the things that have been incorporated in, in sterile compounding anyway have kind of evolved from, from what we know about needing the protection from Ebola. So even though it's certainly a different issue, it's something that really we can use a lot of those principles and what we want to do to get the message across. Right. And, and I can think about the first time I saw that CDC doffing and donning video on Ebola. It, it I was, wa I, I was yeah. watching, I'm it like, just, this is how we got to do yeah. hazardous drugs. Exactly. The same, very yeah. methodical, very slow, but yeah. also have a coach. Because, you know, I think you brought up the fact we're not self-aware. We're not aware that PPE, everybody thinks PPE is going to save us. It's like a seatbelt, you know, that we can right. drive. It's important. Just, you right. need it. You Absolutely. Need it, Don't but, get me wrong about that. No, 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 no. I, I, but I'm, 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 I'm emphasizing the fact that you can, if you don't use it correctly, it's still not going to do what it's supposed to do. So you have to change the behaviors. You have to change the mindset behind that. And this way, it makes that much more effective than, than just kind you know, of going through the mechanisms. What's kind of interesting about this part of the conversation is that when people think of 800 and the costs, they think of facilities, right. and they think that's what they have to do. But your point about the administrative controls, a lot of these aren't huge cost issues. No, they're not. <laughs> they're things you need to do. They're things you need to put in place. And even the PPE, though it certainly adds costs, we need to make sure that folks are using the correct type PPE. for hazardous drugs because there's a lot who don't. And, and there's good information that we need about that as well. So we talk about the facilities being the huge issue, but really the emphasis is almost like we need to do the administrative controls and some of the PPE issues.
So when we find that organizations have policies about hazardous drug safe handling, but they're not being enforced. Yeah. So it's kind of, oh yeah, that's what our policy says, but this is what we do. Right. Well, that has to stop. You know, um, if you have a policy about something, then there should be an expectation for compliance with that policy, which means there should be some consequences if the individuals right. don't follow the policy. Part of that is the education, but it's also part of the culture of safety that we care about your safety, and therefore that's why we have these policies, and let's do it that way. Right. And no one's ever looked at hazardous drug safe handling policies in that way before, which is amazing. Yeah. So what's it going to take? I mean, are we going to need a watershed moment? Uh, from a, uh, uh, from an OSHA, you know, because OSHA seems to have the the regulatory, you know, um, backing that it has in terms of fining. You know, we've seen EPA with hazardous drug, I mean, with hazardous, hazardous waste wastes yeah. materials. How about uh, how do we get people to pay attention? You know, again, you know, if it's it's you know, people hate to pay fines, and and some of those fines can be fairly. It significant. can't be totally punitive. It has to. There has to be engagement. Uh, sure. So, um, and I think you know, some of the um, policies may not be effective sometimes. So you have to get input from your staff and from management to really see what is the best way to go about what you think is you know, going to work. I mean, one thing in particular, one of the administrative controls, and I just want to plug this, is if somebody is pregnant mm. or is considering starting a family, whether it's male or female, uh, they want to, may want to have what's called uh, protective reassignment. Right. And, you know, if that comes up at the last minute, somebody says, hey, I want protective reassignment, and there's no sort of infrastructure in place for that to take place, it's not going to work. But if you bring your staff into the mix, come up with solutions, it will be easier than you realize. Another reason to involve risk managers in Absolutely. health systems. Absolutely. Because they're the ones who are important and, and targeted with protecting us, too. Right. Can you imagine if, if insurance companies now said to healthcare organizations, we're going to start looking at your incidence of cancer and, you know, what you do. And, you know, I mean, it's all about money a lot of times for a lot of organizations. But, you know, it would be nice, and I, and I have yet to hear it, maybe you, you ladies know, you know, a CEO saying this is important, you know, hazardous drug, employee safety, patient safety, making sure that our environment is, is safe is important to us and this is why we need to get behind this new standard. So, I mean, I don't know if you've heard anybody profess this yet, but I think that would be that would be really nice if some, you know, leader of a of a major healthcare organization could could take, you know, that could would be great. pick up the banner I mean, you, you and know, that flag. Sure healthcare are. is all yeah. about taking care of people. Right? You know, yeah. it shouldn't be the evil empire. There's a case in point. Um, so OSHA came out with hazardous drug guidelines in 1986 and here we are more uh, 30 years later right. still arguing about whether that's a good idea or not but there was legislation for the safe needle act in 2000 right and that was implemented and now everybody's using safe needle devices right. so the difference in uh, saying you should do this and you must do this really did change practice in healthcare. So I think that USP standards, which are, some of them are must-dos, will change. Now it's not going to be tomorrow, and it's not even going to be in two years. But I think it will happen, and I think that little change in focus, because I've been talking about this for more than 15 years, mm -hmm. and often I would hear, I'm not going to do that until they make me. Right, exactly. Well... <laughs> We're getting there. July, what, July 1 of 2018, right? <laughs> right. But, you know, that's interesting to, to recognize what the differences are, and I think there's a lot of people who don't. USP is a standard-setting organization. That's right. It is not a governmental entity, entity. It is not an enforcer. It's a standard-setting entity. So it's up to other places and other organizations to enforce that. Now, OSHA certainly does it from a federal perspective. State boards of pharmacy, for example, are usually the enforcers, if we can say, the, the inspectors who do that on a state level. Right. But more and more accrediting organizations are going to be bringing that into their practices. We know some are already doing that, and I'm sure that'll just increase. So even though that may not be a regulation, it's still the way we practice. And clearly, everything we're talking about here is best practice. And right. Isn't that what we want to do in healthcare? And I was just going to say, and OSHA can look at it under yeah. the general duty clause as well. So yeah. it can be enforced. And, and my understanding, the general duty clause has been in effect since, what, 1995? 
Uh, the general duty clause. So. Not, well, the OSHA Act started in 1970. Wow. Yeah. So. And it's being used. But you know, the, the protective reassignment is probably a concept that a lot of people don't know about. Well, alternative duty, that's uh, what Yeah, I, uh, alternative duty is sometimes used as a term. So, I, I mean, that might be worth talking about, at least for right. your organization. Well, and I think what you have to realize, too, it's not just for pregnancy. Right. Um, some of these hazardous drugs affect male reproductive um, um, Capability. capabilities. Yeah. So if uh, an individual is pregnant or either a man or a woman is talking about starting a family or a woman who's breastfeeding, those are the um, different categories. Those are the people that really need to talk about protective reassignment. Okay. And look at the incidence of folks who don't know, who don't have any written statement for people about acknowledging the risks of hazardous right. drugs. I mean, we find that in national surveys that that's the least compliant piece right. with so even amazing. 797. And the wording that's in 800 is exactly the same as what's in, in 797. It needs to be, there needs to be a written acknowledgement from healthcare workers that they understand that they're working with hazardous drugs. Right, right. And, and that's part of the, what's called the hazardous communication. Right. And that's a piece where an individual who is uh, about to begin working mm -hmm. um, would be given information on the drugs, the hazards, the risks, and then periodically reminded of it through courses. So. And, and, and I, you know your 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 statement there, Ellen. Just I, I think the NIOSH list is is the NIOSH document and the and the efforts that NIOSH has done in terms of updating the list, separating the hazardous drug list from the alert. And we know mm -hmm. we understand that the alert is in the process of being updated. But I think with the recent publication of the 2016 um, NIOSH list and the, the the methodical nature in which the NIOSH scientists and experts, reviewers, went through that data and provided a tremendous amount of guidance on, you know, what you're doing, how you're going to do it, what you need, how to protect yourself, and the different tables and the categories, I, I thought is great because I think the more information we can get out to practitioners, you know, even consumers, the, the more, you know, the more informed they are going to be about making good decisions about protecting themselves. Absolutely. And these aren't scientific documents. These are easily read Absolutely. documents that I think everybody should, you know, spend five, ten minutes looking at because it really has that much information in a very readable way. Well, and, and the cool thing is it's free. And it's you know, free. And, and it's and available. Dollars that work. <laughs> that, well, that's and, it. <laughs> it, it. Exactly. And, and some of the things about that document, I think, are also a mystery to people. Right. They think, you know, where's the, where's the genesis of that? Well, right. look at the document. You'll find out why that drug is on the list and, and what the information is. And it's also a public process. Yeah. As, as the list gets changed, and it looks like it's going to get changed every couple of years or so, that's the intent as well. There's a public process, there's an opportunity for public comment on that document. So we all can have an input in that. It's not something that's done in the shrouds of mystery. No, no, and it's not done with haste either. No. So it's not like, it's, it's a very, methodical. it's very it's scientifically methodical. well de vetted. Well, I think it's really interesting about the list is it's less than two thirds of the drugs on the list are antineoplastic yeah, agents. Yeah. So by separating that out, that really brings to the forefront, hey, it's not just chemo yes. I need to be concerned about. And that um, adds weight to the fact that we have to move beyond just oncology settings to um, talk about USP 800 and uh, safe handling. I'm worried about nursing homes. Oh, I'm yeah. worried yeah. about, nursing you know, uh, patients getting chemotherapy in the home. We're not doing a good job of preparing them either. So I think that, you know, this will focus people's attention on safety related to handling Absolutely. drugs. Home health care, that, yeah. you know, is a... And nursing homes. And nursing <laughs> homes, yep. Well, and you know, I think NIOSH did a great service when, with the 2014 list when they, they sorted that into three categories, yeah, right. the antineoplastics, the non-antineoplastics, and the reproductive hazards. Right. What worries me a little bit is people say, oh, I only have to worry about that antineoplastic, only table, 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 one. table one. And there's some pretty nasty drugs, particularly on table two, <laughs> yes. that worry me. But the information about why they're on that list is there and readily accessible. And people can make, some of them are situational hazards, oxytocin, for example. Some are really a much broader thing. But, you know, your issue about nursing homes and things like that, long-term care, 
some of those folks are, you know, a, a limited number of staff is crushing and manipulating those drugs and they need to know what those risks are. Right. And then that's another place for uh, this information to get to because those staff probably don't have that education embedded in their orientation. Yeah. Yeah. And e even the community-based practices, I think that's where I'm most concerned about is that when you think about how healthcare shifts based on reimbursement, you know, a lot of the oncology, a lot of the treatment of cancer now is being done mm -hmm. in, in a community setting, in a, in a physician's, you know, a medical office-based practice or a physician's practice. And, and those patients and those surrounding environments really need to be aware that you know, if they had asbestos in there, they'd close the whole yeah. building down. But, you know, here we're pushing grams and grams of these, you know, IARC-1. Known drug. human carcinogens. Known yeah. human carcinogens, yeah. exactly. And you know, even the placement of that worries me. And health systems, I, I see this all the time. You'll see patients getting cyclophosphamide, a known human carcinogen, right. next to somebody getting uh, you know, IVIG, for example, yeah. or something. So you see immunocompromised patients right next to patients getting some pretty toxic agents, and nobody's thought that process out. You know, maybe there's a better way to do it. Um, if I have to give BCG to somebody, mm -hmm. maybe I need to do that last in the day, or, you know, those kind of things that are, again, are administrative controls that can be done and really help the safety piece for all of us. You know, you mentioned that the, the breakdown in the tables just want to go down to the drug. I think it's, as a pharmacist, I find it really fascinating when you really look at some of the drugs that are on table two and table three of the NIOSH list. Things that we thought were very <laughs> innocuous, innocuous. Yes. and they are in fact, you know, significant hazards. So what do you think is going to happen over the next two years? We're kind of on a T minus, and I think, you know, Marty, your, appointment, your, your statement before about a way to, you know, a way to someone starts enforcing it, and people do that. I mean, that's, that, is a, that is a management strategy that people will say. And I just real, I wanted to share a bit of news. You know, my, my frustration with 797 has been here we are 13 years out, and there's still only 28 states that require compliance and you know we're the state we're in now has no regulations whatsoever uh, Pennsylvania by the way um, <laughs> so Pennsylvania people you got to get yeah, uh, get with it <laughs> um, but what I find interesting is I you know I was I was talking to someone on a board of pharmacy in the in a western state and they said that their governor three years ago told all of the boards no no new regulations no new regulations. So here you had a board of pharmacy who's been trying to pass something that's about patient safety, and you know we could even argue, you know, 800s about patient safety because it minimizes exposure. That their hands are tied because of political means or financial means. I mean, uh, I mean, but, I, yeah, but, <laughs> even however, if that's the case. CMS last year yes. in November put into their hospital conditions of participation virtually everything that's in 797. So there's some embedded pieces in there about hazardous drugs. Yep. I think that leveled the playing field because not only CMS, so the federal agencies, but also the state agencies and the accreditation organizations that need to follow those CMS conditions of participation have to follow them. Right. So it really levels that from a, a perspective of who's looking at it and what the occupational issues are. So maybe we need to continue to drive it financially, because yeah. that gets people's attention, right? Yeah. Do the right thing, because yeah. you're going to get fined. I think, you know, we've talked so many times, and I think we've all said it, if stuff didn't cost anymore, there would be no question that we'd implement all this. Right. <laughs> But, but then organ so organizations will have to be responsible in um, planning ahead. Right. So two years is a very short time if you're talking about change in an organization. Yeah. And so uh, if there's budget cycles, perhaps, that have to be, you know, uh, budget items have to be added, then you have budget cycles, which means that you're six months or right. a year in advance planning for those changes. So people need to get on board now. If they're not using closed system transfer devices, they're going to have to start investigating those products that are available now uh, and so that people have choices about what products they're purchasing. If they're implementing new policies, if they're selecting new PPE, for instance, because they haven't been buying gowns before, right. all those things have to happen. And they don't happen overnight in a big organization. Uh -huh. The bigger it is, the longer it takes to get things done. So we have to start changing the um, mindset now 
or from top down and from bottom up. So we've got Absolutely. staff who have to get on board and we have administrators. And unfortunately, in many organizations, the administrators are not clinical experts. So if I need to uh, make a case for appropriate personal protective equipment, then uh, I may have to convince an administrator of the necessary, you know, that Cost. is necessary. Yeah. So uh, people have to communicate about what the standards say. So that means they have to know what the standards say. So people have to know what the standards say in order to make the changes in their organization and they have to have an action plan so that by July 1 in 18 they've implemented all the change. And this was really a very unusual move from USP's perspective because normally when a new chapter becomes official or gets published, it becomes official in six months. But there was a recognition because the committee is practitioners right. uh, to know that, for example, budget cycles needed to be included. So that was a significant departure from normal to extend that official date. And people say, well, it, it was just two and a half years. Well, you know what? That was really first published in March of 2014. So we really do have four and a half years from that time because there was very little difference in a facility issue that was discussed there then. So if people were attuned to it, they've really had a, a significant amount of time, but it's still running out. Uh, but, but I would even go back as far as 2008, Patty. Yeah. You know, when, when USP 797 added the hazardous drugs as CSP section, if you had been paying attention back then, in 2008, and you had embraced those standards, you would be ready. You know, you, you know, Absolutely. Uh, and, yeah. and, and again, it all goes to enforcement, you know, expectation, you know, do we have the money? And what I find interesting about that statement is about budget cycles, we never have money to do it right but we always have money to fix it. When a crisis occurs or someone gets hurt or there's a press news release about an organization, magically the money shows up. How, how, you know, how does that work? I mean, you know, I, I like to say we can do it easy or we can do it hard. The easy way is to be proactive, understand what the standard is, pay attention, do the right thing for the right reasons. The hard thing is waiting for CMS, Joint Commission, OSHA, somebody come in, a lawyer to come in, and then it's always 10 times more, 100 times more than it would have cost us, and everybody's under stress. Everybody, the organization gets turned on its ear, and it's not fun. It's not fun. I also think that one of the challenges here is that people always think this doesn't apply to me. Absolutely. Because there, sometimes there's exceptions in standards. It doesn't apply to low volume producers right. and things like that. Well, this clearly says all entities in yes. which hazardous drugs are present and all healthcare workers, which means that we don't eliminate the physicians or the healthcare, uh, the housekeepers, right. you know, everybody who works in those settings. So that's a message that needs to get out. Right. There's no exceptions here. And no one's immune. No, if you think about it, nobody is immune from being exposed potentially. If your organization is handling this, treating patients with any one of these medications that are on any of the, you know, table one, two, or three, your employees, your patients, your environment is at risk of being contaminated. You almost look at it as a chain of custody from the time it comes into yeah, the absolutely. hospital to the time, however, it leaves, leaves the, the hospital. hospital. And so, not just hospitals. And not just it's hospitals. Anywhere. Yeah. Uh, it's anywhere. But, anywhere. but, I mean, that's so true. We need to think of it in terms of not the, the very specific thing that we taught of other compounding chapters when we're talking about storage and, and compounding. This needs to be the guy on the loading dock who's right. getting the tote from the supplier <laughs> uh, all the way through the housekeeper who's, and the environmental services folks who are doing the disposal. So, advice. So... What kind of advice would you give to someone who's not a nurse? You come in, Marty, you know, I'm sure you see this all the time. I see this with pharmacists. You, you see what they're doing and they're not getting it. I mean, they're not wearing PPE. They're not using safe handling precautions. Uh, you know, what do you say to them? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Well, there's a hundred things that I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I'm, uh, yeah, so to start with um, that PPE is essential. Yes that we can't tolerate um, not non-compliance with using personal protective equipment because every handling activity is an opportunity for exposure. Right. So some of it's education, but some of it's enforcement. Right. We need to um, make sure that if you're, I call you if you're non-compliant. Um, as far as CSTDs, um, nurses don't like 
a speed bump in their day. Yeah. And so adding new equipment that has a, a learning curve and you have to figure out how to use it, um, we'll have to uh, stay the course and um, you know, be open to that for the purpose of personal safety. But how do you get people to change? I think you know, one of the things that I've, got, I've come to realize is that I think you know, we're, we're intelligent people, we're adults, and everybody wants to protect their self-esteem. How, how, how do we make it safe for people to say, you know what, I really don't know anything about this. How do, I, how do we not make them feel inadequate, and how do we truly get them to understand the whys behind the what and embrace change? Because uh, unless people want to change, I mean, uh, you know, there's that famous quote, you know, any, any, any change, it's first violently opposed, it's ridiculed, and then it becomes self-evident. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're still, you know, even with USP 797, we're still in the ridiculed um, <laughs> phase. But for, for, for many, it's become self-evident. I think for, you know, for us who live with this day in and day out and is the essence of what we do, it is self-evident because we're constantly exposed to it. You know, you think about the practitioners who don't see this on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not honed in. They're... Their, their news feeds don't give them this information that constantly reminds them of the importance that it can happen to them. H how do we get them to change? Well, I know that um, I, I've never really been opposed to using personal protective equipment, be, but I became committed to using it when I read about surface contamination right. in the hospital or the work environment. I was giving chemo every day of yeah. my life. And uh, when I read the article in 1999 that Tom Connor wrote about um, uh, surface contamination and how rampant it was, oh, it was uh, open eye-opening to me. He repeated that study or a similar study in, in 2010 and the results were almost exactly the same. Exactly. So in 10 years there was no improvement despite the fact that we had uh, guidelines. Right. Uh, I think the surface contamination is a good argument to convince nurses that of the opportunity for exposure. Right. Maybe not actual exposure but it's every opportunity for exposure. CSTDs will reduce that environmental contamination significantly. It is uh, um, the main reason I think that USP decided to uh, make that a requirement for drug administration because that's, those areas are also contaminated. So I think convincing people of their personal risk right. for exposure is what will be helpful, but that's not enough. Education is necessary but insufficient. So we have to have the other support things overcoming the barriers like having the PPE in the right place so I don't have to walk a thousand right. feet to get it. Um, in every, stock. In stock, yeah. in right supply, yeah. <laughs> in an adequate supply. There's even studies that show if you just have a few gowns, people are less likely to use them when you right, have a big right, stack right, of gowns. Right, because they don't want to be the Human less, less take, the, take the less one, right? <laughs> yeah, and then we have to have policies that require it, and then there have to be policies enforcement so that everybody is watching out for everybody else. That's, you, know, uh, you know, if I knew how to change behavior, I'd be rich. I well, <laughs> But we have to, those are the kinds of things that we know help. Education does help, and yeah. training helps. Yes. Uh, validating competency means not I just don't teach you, but I watch you do it, and then I give you feedback right. about that. Retur return demonstration. There you go. My favorite so. nursing term. Yeah. <laughs> the issue on the surface sampling, I think, is, is very important. And if people just look at 797, and I know a lot of people just look at that and try to compare what's in 800, when we talk about environmental monitoring in 797, we're talking microbial monitoring. When we're talking about looking for environmental sampling in 800, we're talking about surface samples and looking for the rogue hazardous drug that has escaped our, our containment. So your, your issue is a really good point because I think if people could visually yes. see that, you know, here's my workspace and here's what was collected from that, mm -hmm. It, it's a real eye-opener. Right. It should be part of the hazardous communication part of this. Right. Where, And that's an OSHA standard. I mean, this is a hazardous drugs. I mean, the um, OSHA standard really does apply that individuals who are handling hazardous drugs should go through communication. They should have a required communication before they start handling. Mm -hmm. And that should be a piece of it. Make it as as impactful as possible because that's that's going to make a big difference. One of the things that always strikes me as sort of an analogous situation in healthcare is uh, uh, 
radiologists mm -hmm. and radiology technicians. They all wear badges right. because it's a way of collecting that information. Radiation Are they being safety. exposed to things? Yep. And it's kind of an analogous situation. They put practices in place so that they minimize that exposure. Right. Well, nobody ever says, gee, we're not going to give you badges because we don't think that's important. Or wear or lead aprons. Yeah. Right. So we need well, there's to... only one badge left. I'm not going to use right. it. Right. I mean, everybody in that practice uses them. Right. Let's hope. Um, but we need to make some analogous situations in the hazardous drug thing. It's just that it's not as easy to collect that information. But the surface sampling for the hazardous drug contamination would be one way that at least would visualize this for people. Well, and I think it, it, real importantly is, is you know, we know that the only way to avoid being exposed is to not handle it. I mean, and that's not an option in healthcare. Right, yeah. We gotta take care of patients. Right, yeah. but I think, you know, the, the vial contamination and the contamination that can happen as a result of a spill or a breakage, the question I see or the challenge I see is what are we doing to get it out of the environment? What are we doing about cleaning and disinfecting and decontamination and deactivating? We know we can't avoid it, but you know, are we doing the best we can? And we know from infection and uh, you know infection control studies that, you know, a dirty room you know, when you think about where, you know, microorganisms are and hand hygiene, what are we doing to make sure that we're cleaning those environments with the appropriate agents to, in fact, either, you know, deactivate them and, and get them out of the, uh, out of the space? Because how many people have we talked to that we say, well, how do you decontaminate your area? And they say, with alcohol. Alcohol, and right. Alcohol's not a decontamination <laughs> agent. Alcohol's not even a cleaner. That's right. It's right. really good solvent. All you know? you're doing, if it, all Spreading you're using it around. is... Yeah, moving it from one place to another, you're not getting rid of it. So we need to get that more aware too. Yeah, and that's a that's an area where nurses need to have more information too, because they need to be decontaminating the surfaces Absolutely. in their environment where they're having hazardous drugs. And the chairs, the pumps, the everything Correct. else that's ivy poles. Yeah, mm -hmm. computer there. terminals. I yeah. mean, drugs have been found yeah. everywhere, even in elevator buttons. Tops of of you know the yeah. place where you check out. <laughs> right. And right. it's not just nurses, it's cleaning staff who don't speak English as well, so you have to have it in multiple right. languages. All right, uh, appropriately accessible. So what kind of advice would you ladies give to someone that is thinking about starting a job that, that handles hazardous drugs? In healthcare. In healthcare, well, that would be the time for the beginning of a medical surveillance program. When I see somebody who first um, comes in for a baseline, um, um, it would be the opportunity for a um, education, discussion about you know their medical history, work history, reproductive history. Um, it's a confidential way of getting any kind of questions that they may have and really develop a dialogue so they really understand sort of the impact and how important it is to be, um, you know, to understand what they're stepping into literally and figuratively. What would you use as a baseline, CBC and DIF? Um, you know, there's so many different drugs, so you probably, I mean, the most important thing, the word you get the bang for your buck is with the history, yeah. actually. And then a physical, probably baseline because of organ damage I would do, um, certainly a CBC. Uh, biological monitoring, which is looking at metabolites or genotoxic endpoints, right. probably doesn't really make a difference just because there's so many different drugs and um, you know it really you're probably not going to see anything okay um, unless there's a true exposure you may consider at that time but but, um, but history really a is. history is really the important thing and it's a pretty straightforward not that difficult to do I mean not, well, well I shouldn't say that I mean getting a good history is, is challenging well I think for non-occupational medicine physicians it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of history because sure. you really want to get a work history as well. You know the, you know the time of day, what kind of, you know specifically a log of what kind of um, HDs that they've used. Right. Um, you know wh what, um, you know how often they work. You know there's you want to get down to some of the nitty gritty, particularly at the, in the baseline. Reproductive history is very important as well. So, uh, so li listening to you talk about like starting this registry or trying to try to come up with a cumulative, I mean, how do we get nursing and, and pharmacy to start thinking about, you know, I need to, I need to start recording like how many, how many, how many certain types of chemos I handle or, or patients I see or administration, you know, uh, you know, infusions I give. 
when the oncology thing exploded, you know, probably 30 years ago, uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, how, how often people are treated and where, we used to keep logs. Mm -hmm. And it was a terribly manual process. We figure with all the technology we have now, it shouldn't even be that hard to be able to do that because we ought to be able to capture things based on who made and who checked and who administered agents. So, we, you know, we think of that as an insurmountable burden now, but I bet it's easier to do than it was 30 years ago when we had to do it. Maybe. Do you ever see people keeping those logs anywhere? Um, no, I actually don't. But I was just thinking as you were uh, mentioning that with the electronic medical yeah. records, I mean, there is a log cool. there yeah. and you could probably extract some of it yeah. from that. Well, I find it amazing. We have so much information. You know, a very common question I'll ask people is how many doses of, a, of, a, how many doses of chemo do you make a day? And people can't tell me right off the top of their head. I mean, we have data. We have, we have electronic health records. We have pharmacy systems. We have nursing systems. And we have this huge data pool. But no one is using the data, doing any data mining to really come up with, like, oh, my God, do you realize how many grams of cyclophosphamide do you handle a day or administer a day? And, you know, think about from, a, from an occupational health physician, that would be invaluable data to start risking people out that, I, and maybe I'm, I'm misinterpreting it, but, you know, you think about exposure and lower exposure potentially leads to lower risk. But if you have someone who's on the front line, you know, what's the probability that they're going to be at greater risk of, of, of there harm? There is still a mystery, a little bit of a mystery in that, probably more than a little, in health systems because so many people work part-time yes. at different organizations. So where the organization that you're dealing with, for example, well, and I mean, you may have all those policies in place and, and a way to look at it, but maybe those folks work part-time at somebody at some other place on weekends that has have none of these controls in place. So that's kind of a tricky thing to, to pick up as well. That is a tricky thing, and yeah. that's why it's so important to know how to do a good work history, because you do try to capture that. And that's, you know, um, unfortunately not every hospital, particularly the smaller ones, have an occupational health physician or even an employee health nurse right. who can be taught. So it's going to really be incumbent upon sometimes the, you know, their personal provider uh, to get that kind of information, and that's, I think, is going to be a real challenge. All right, ladies. So the final question: What's the goal of all of this? What's the what's the ideal? Let, let's start with with pharmacy, Patty. Well, I, I guess from a pharmacy perspective, the issue goes back decades, and we know that we need to compound things correctly for patients. It's a patient safety issue, Absolutely. but we need to add on the recognition that there are risks to us not just pharmacists and pharmacy techs, but everybody in the whole healthcare organization needs to be protected. We know there's risks there, so it's our obligation to do something about it. And, and pharmacy, I mean, we're the, we're the stewards of drugs. So we, we need, I think, in some regards, we need to be the leaders yeah. of this and, and work closely with nursing and with medicine to make sure that they get it. All right, how about nursing? I would love to see uniform practice across organizations, and I would love to... Um, be somewhere where this is not the first time someone's hearing the message about hazardous drug exposure in taking care of patients. I want nurses to be safe doing the work that they love right. and they shouldn't have to risk their health. And I think these standards go a long way to making our workplaces safer for nurses and other workers. Absolutely. How about medicine, that one? Well, as an occupational medicine physician, workers are my patients. Right. So I want to keep them healthy. I want to it's a preventive medical specialty. I want them per, to um, be able to avoid the risks. Um, I want them to stay healthy. And also, if there's something that is uh, discovered early, that we can do something about it early. I mean, this is my passion. I want my patients, the workers, to be healthy. Well, ladies, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate all of your passion and what you do on a day-to-day uh, basis and you know I'll ask the audience are you ready for 800?